It's uh, John Carter here. Uh, welcome to Radio Lou, broadcasting on radiolou.co.uk. Today I'm going to have a few words with Dave Rees, who runs A New Day, a magazine devoted to Jethro Tull. And um, Dave, I know you're there now, so just like you, if you could tell us a little bit about the magazine, how you started it, and a little bit about your life with Jethro Tull, and in particular with Martin Barr, who you know lives locally, and... Um, who we who's played a few times in Lou and um, just um, yeah, just give us a bit of background if you would. Yes, well, I've been a Jethro Tull fan since about 1972, I think. So yeah. not not the very early days. So I missed the first four years, I think. But so obviously Martin was was there then. He joined at the end of '68. So Martin was always a part of Jethro Tull for me. And I started the Tull magazine, I think, in about '85 purely because there was never anything in the music press about Tull. You know, obviously it followed on from the, the punk rock thing, which... Uh, they were a bit underground, weren't they, with Jethro Tull? Yes, they were, and it was very difficult to find out what they were doing, you know, where they were playing, and albums coming out, etc. So I just did a little photocopy thing, really hoping that somebody would pick up on it and do it properly, but uh, nobody did, so I kind of got lumbered with it ever since. So when did you start that off, Dave? 1985, that was. Oh, right, yeah, okay. And so I'm, I'm, I've done 100, and this, the latest issue is number 135, which is quite ridiculous, really, when you think about it. Funny way to spend your life, but... Um, it keeps me occupied. Well, that's absolutely brilliant. And, of course, when you first recognised Jethro Tull, uh, what was the first concert you went to? Um, that was ooh, The War Child, 1974. That was at the Rainbow in Finsbury, which is now a, a giant mosque, I think. Yeah. And, uh, like, you know, like most sensible people, I'd go to see one concert per tour, you know, something like that. But um, it kind of became an obsession after a while, and I tried to see them as often as I could when they existed. So I must have seen them, I don't know, two, three, four hundred times. I've got no idea, really, from never, never counted. Yeah, uh, and you've interviewed Martin and the rest of the band, because, of course, Ian Anderson leads it all. He writes all the songs and stuff. But Martin was with them for over 40 years, so he was a sound of Jethro Tull, wasn't he? Yeah. Well, Ian, in fact, I'm sure the first time he ever said it, said it to me back in 87, uh, the first interview we did with Ian. And one of the standout quotes was, I said, how long do you think Jeff Rotel will go on for? And he said, well, as long as I can. He said, but there would never be a Jeff Rotel without Martin Barr. And to be fair, he, he stuck to that. He doesn't uh, He doesn't go out as Jethro Tull officially. I mean, yeah, so obviously he valued Martin Barr as, as much as the fans did. So you've interviewed Martin a few times, haven't you? I mean, uh, yes, many times, yeah. What do you sort of make of him? Is, it, is it, What sort of chap is he, really? Uh, well, he's two different chaps. When he, when he was with Jethro Tull, he was very quiet and shy, really, almost. You know, he'd always hide on stage and he'd hide after the shows and he'd try to avoid fans, etc., etc. But he's a completely different chap now since Jeff Rotel split up and he's out on his own. He's uh, the archetypal showman now. He's, he's like a completely different bloke, but he's always been a very friendly chap. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the official line is they didn't split up, but Ian just said it won't be Jethro Tull. But, but he hasn't completely dismissed that idea of, of Jethro Tull coming back in some form. But So it wasn't an official split, it just ended kind of thing. So tell me a little bit about um, some of the exotic places you've been to over the years. I'm sure you must have a few interesting stories to tell about your exploits. I've got lots of interesting stories, but uh, I couldn't possibly <laughs> tell them. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we'll skip over that. But yeah, I've, I've, I think I've been to I've 19 countries I've been to see them in at last count. Although, to be honest, all we ever see is bars on the way to the gig and bars on the way back from the gig. So we, we've never been touristy type. So how many of them were you sort of went out in a, in a group in those days? <laughs> I think it used to be about half a dozen or more. Not always the same people, but uh, um, yeah, we used to have a good time. And, you know, we'd, we'd meet hundreds and hundreds of people that we knew in Germany. Not so much now. I mean, the crowds have dwindled a bit. But, um, you know, of course, people get too old to do it, really. 
myself included, I think. Of course, in the old days, Toll were playing to massive crowds, weren't they, in the 70s? Yeah, oh yeah. They played at uh, Madison Square Gardens about six times in New York or something, didn't they? Did you actually get to to any of that stuff or not in those days no i've been to america three times i think and just you know the crowds are still big five thousand or so mm. but um, i never got to see them in the in the, the massive days when they were like one of the top three bands in the world i think at the time yeah so you've got nothing to recall about you know any of your trips uh, abroad at all i'm sure you must have a little bit to uh, uh, you know to say <laughs> about uh, about about how you got there and uh did you travel on a, sort of in a car, on a convoy? Or? It was uh, nearly always in in a car. Uh, a few times we'd hire a, a van or a car. I suppose the most memorable one was we went to Budapest, which was um, built as the Hungarian Woodstock. And um, we arrived in a, in a cab, I think. And the queue to get in was like two miles long. I thought, Christ, what are, how are we, we going to do this? And we just spoke to somebody at the gate. But they obviously couldn't speak very good English, but they ushered us through and went and got us a jeep and they took us right down to the front and delivered us to the backstage bar. And we discovered then that they thought we were Jethro Tull trying to get in. <laughs> so uh, that, that was a bonus. And a couple of times we got mistaken for the band and got very well looked after. So obviously we, we didn't, never, never spilt the beans. Uh, so what happened when the, you know, when the band turned up? Did you get thrown out, presumably? No, no, no. We were, fo- we were fine. We just stayed in the bar. Nobody bothered us. Really? But, um, we had a, had a fantastic weekend, yeah. So you didn't go out front to see them. You just stayed behind the bar backstage. Yeah, yeah. Oh, but the bar was you know, within full view of the stage, so it was... It was a perfect place to be. So what's the general... Um, I know I'm concentrating a little bit on Martin because obviously he's known to us here in Lou and uh, we're, yeah. we're all very fond of him down here. You know, what's the general sort of consensus of opinion about his contribution that he's made both to Tull and um, in the music business generally? It's all, I mean, everybody's always said he's you know, possibly the most underrated guitarist in, in rock music because... Most people, I suppose, always thought Jethro Tull was Ian Anderson. You know, it's uh, still now in America. I mean, thousands of people think it's a, that's his name. They think Ian is Jethro Tull. So it's not like Steve Hackett in Genesis. Nobody really took any notice of what the guitarist's name was. But of course, that's changed massively since since Martin went out on his own last. Um, Nine years, good grief, nine years. Yeah, and of course, I mean, bringing it up to date, I mean, the fact that he runs his own band and uh, he's been doing these Jethro Tull tours with one or two ex-members being drawn yeah. in. Um, tell us a little bit about that and how you think that's gone down. It's It's been fantastically received. I mean, to see Martin's band now, without Jethro Tull members as well, but he goes out, I think, with Dee Palmer from Tull and John Noyce sometimes, Clive Bunker. And um, which, of course, you know, many people will never have seen those people with Jethro Tull because it's so long ago. Barry Barlow, was, I think, was going to do a few few gigs with him. So it's a rare chance to see them playing Tull music. And, of course, no flute, which some people find strange, but Martin brings so much more to it. And he's, he's such a fantastic guitarist. And it's, I mean, even, you know, before this lockdown, I think Martin played 2,000 sellout in Brazil somewhere, which is comparable to the numbers that Ian plays to, I think, these days. So it's just getting bigger. So, I mean, this this virus thing has come at worst possible time, I mean, for everybody, but particularly for Martin, because this was going to be such a big year. Yeah. And he's just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Yes, I, 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 I spoke to him and he's a bit frustrated. and uh, But he does bring interesting arrangements and, and uh, different angles to the tell music doesn't he these days absolutely yeah yeah which makes it a bit more sort of it it's the original stuff but it it's it's um performed slightly differently which i think people generally enjoy don't they i think oh they do yeah i mean on facebook it's just covered with people raving about the martin bar bed you know and, and i mean many people are bitter about the way it's split and the way Ian's just gone off without martin to such an extent that you know it, it's kind of like martin versus ian now and people say i'd rather go and see martin and uh it's just gone crazy, really. Yeah, yeah, your magazine, I think, tends to reflect that a little bit, doesn't it? There's a, a section with Ian Anderson and a section with Martin Parr, and uh, yeah, yeah. they're both sort of independent, and um, they've gone their separate ways, and uh, quite interesting the way you have to deal with that in your magazine. It must be quite difficult, is it, do you think, or is it or is it something that um, you handle? It's it's not so difficult for me. I mean, it, it it's probably difficult for the you know, these facebook page admins because i mean you get some really nasty 
vitriolic comments about Ian regarding Martin Barr, which I don't understand. After 43 years, I think it was, Ian's got every right to work with different people. You know, it's, it's sad. I mean, I wish Martin was still there in a way. Although if he wasn't, we wouldn't have the Martin Barr band now. And uh, I'd hate to see that disappear because it's it's a, a fantastic show. A, a revitalisation, isn't it? Of, yes, uh, it is. But of course, I, I don't get that you know editing the mag because if somebody writes a nasty letter i just just don't put it in so yeah it's all it's all trying you know try to be reasoned and balanced in the mag yeah yeah uh, right. whereas facebook anybody can put anything on there um with, with impunity really yeah yeah well i have to say that anybody who follows jethro toll or likes martin or, or ian or anything associated with jethro toll it's worthwhile buying um a new day magazine it's always very entertaining and amusing so i can oh, there's you. a bit of a plug for you and um, <laughs> it's it's excellent and so what else do you uh, what else is a new day up to i mean uh, it, i i know it was formed when was it formed a new day was was, was that was that some time uh, well, the magazine was 85 and then the record company followed in in about 1990 i think and we did a few of your albums of course fantastic albums that they are yeah and yeah. uh, of course well, you now don't we need to say uh, that to be honest it's <laughs> not about me it's about you so. <laughs> yeah. so but 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 yeah so you what sort of artist have you have you had on in your um repertoire um mostly prog rock and some some folk like vicky clayton and of course we've done we've done solo albums from clive bunker the original toll drummer and martin alcock who played keyboards for several years with Tull and of course now we've got the New Day Festival which we've been running for the fifth year assuming it goes on and August Bank Holiday at which Martin's played every year and of course Ian Anderson played the first year so there's always a Toll connection at um, a New Day Festival Yeah, no, absolutely and of course with this dreaded virus the festival may not see the light of day May not but still over four months ago so we've still got our yeah, fingers crossed yeah, and yeah. quite hopeful And you know Martin uh, played down here a couple of times uh, I think you came down to one or two of the gigs that he played at Blue Festival in 2012, I think. I came, yes, I came to that one. I saw Martin. I, I couldn't get to see the Stranglers because, uh, no, the Levelers, I think. We had tickets for the whole weekend. Right. Couldn't get in. Um, yeah, and... Uh, that was a great festival then. Yeah, yeah, that was the early days of his band, wasn't it? The two, it was two thousand and twelve, wasn't it? So yeah, it was. Yeah, it, it was. Um, and then, and then you. And went, of course, he played a little acoustic thing in a, in an art centre there in in the centre of Blue. It, yeah, in the Mill, Millpool Centre, he played in two thousand and fourteen. That's right. How did you remember that one? That was a an interesting one, wasn't it? It was great. Yeah, I, I didn't have great expectations to be honest. I look at Martin as an electric guitarist, um, but I thought it was fantastic. They were just brilliant, absolutely brilliant. So um, yeah, yeah. I'd like to see him do some more of those. And, he had, and, and there was a lot of banter, wasn't there, at the time? In the uh, in there the, was, yeah. In the yeah. in the mid Millpool Centre, I seem to remember Hamster who was a bit of a character at the time. <laughs> yeah, uh, good old Hamster was yeah. uh, was uh, was um, uh, having a go at Mars. Well, they were, they were having a little bit of a dialogue uh, during the during the concert, which I thought was, was really amusing. So that was it uh, was, and Martin handled it really well, you know. And that that was something that I couldn't. Eat even imagine him doing you know five years before yeah. then when he was yeah. he was like quiet as a mouse yeah yeah no absolutely no no that was absolutely uh, great so um that's an interesting little bit of uh background for everybody uh dave i'd like to i'd like to thank you for uh, recalling one or two events uh, well, thank you for on, on. on the uh, on the uh, jethro toll front and uh, in particular about uh, about martin and um uh, we will uh, look forward perhaps to hearing from you again uh, to talk about uh, one or two other things uh, at some time in the future. Thank you anyway, David. Thank you, John. John Carter interviewing Dave Rees of A New Day, New Day Festival and A New Day magazine, the magazine of Jethro Tull. This has been a PL13 Festival's presentation for Radio Lou.